Thank you very much for the uh, opportunity to uh, come to uh, wonderful Singapore. Uh, it's uh, my third trip and still only uh, less than four days actually total in Singapore, so it's very short times each time. Uh, I also have a very, very short time to speak, which I, I didn't quite realize. I'd looked at the, the schedule incorrectly, and uh, so I will be speaking very, very quickly uh, and going through these slides quickly. Uh, fever. So we've just heard an excellent talk on fever. Uh, fever can be good, it can be bad, but in neurological injury, it is very bad uniformly. Uh, in st uh, observational studies of intracerebral hemorrhage, of subarachnoid hemorrhage, of traumatic brain injury, post-cardiac arrest, fever always is, leads to a worsened outcome for neurological injury. Uh, and it, there are certainly many, many mechanisms which explain why this happens. Uh, so we know that hyperthermia or fever is bad for neurological injury. Does that mean hypothermia is good? Uh, there is written documents on hypothermia as treatments uh, as far back as Egyptian times uh, and in the Bible and in various uh, medical uh, uh, observations even in England in the uh, late uh, 1600s. Uh, in Napoleon's army, uh, his chief uh, surgeon also used hypothermia as a therapy uh, for uh, and anesthetic purposes for uh, amputations. Uh, and Sir William Osler used hypothermia as a therapy for fevers. However, these are, uh, and we certainly use hypothermia routinely for food preservation, but those are all non-neurological uh, instances of hypothermia as a therapy. The first really uh, uh, ex uh, explicit research into hypothermia for neurological injury was uh, Dr. Temple Fay, a neurosurgeon in Philadelphia, uh, who used uh, hypothermia in a variety of different settings, mainly post-operatively. So you can see uh, his setup uh, of these patients, which actually looks very, very similar to what we do now uh, in our neurological, uh, neuroscience intensive care units. So you have a cooling device, uh, which is then uh, transmitting some cooling agent into the patient. Uh, Faye used a, uh, temp tended to use these postoperatively, especially in tumor patients. And so the catheter would deliver the cooling fluid uh, into the tumor bed uh, or a site of operation. And so you see the x-rays here uh, of the cooling agents. And so cooled directly into the uh, site of uh, the operations. And you can see here one of his patients here sitting, you know, perfectly fine with the cooling uh, being applied to him postoperatively. And you can probably see his uh, cause of his uh, uh, operation was his smoking his cigarette, and this probably was a metastatic tumor there. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Faye's research was all at the same time and started to become published, or he attempted to try to publish them at the same time uh, World War II was uh, coming about. And as it turned out, uh, we found out that hypothermia research is also being done by the Nazis, uh, probably less scientifically as it turned out. And so anything to do with hypothermia uh, became very stigmatized and was not uh, suitable for publication uh, until uh, you see here that uh, he, Faye was able to finally start publishing uh, after, significantly after World War II, some of his data, uh, and really didn't get published till the 50s or so, uh, so significantly uh, afterwards, even though he'd done his work in the late 30s and 40s. Uh, Nagovsky in Russia had also been starting to do some research in uh, hypothermia. Uh, and in a more systematic fashion. And you can see then uh, publications developing in the early 60s. And so you see that the rate of publication of uh, hypothermia articles uh, really didn't start coming out to the 60s. And then all of a sudden, you know, slowly plugging along a little bit, a little bit over the years, over the decades, uh, until the 2000s when uh, hypothermia uh, articles uh, shot off. Uh, and uh, it was basically the thought of hypothermia, uh, this concept of hypothermia, and, and as Nagovsky says, hibernation, uh, in, inhibiting the destructive processes in the living tissues. So this is the idea, and particularly in neurological injury. Uh, and 
what really started setting off the literature in hypothermia was positive results in two different tests the F, uh, in, in the application of hypothermia after cardiac arrest published in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, two randomized controlled trials, one done in Europe, one done in Australia, uh, which showed incredible improvement, both neurological uh, outcome uh, as well as morbidity and, mortal and mortality as well uh, that significantly sh uh, improved neurological outcome, uh, in significantly decreased mortality uh, for these patients with cardiac arrest. Um, so this is uh, the Australian study. Uh, there are, were certainly side effects of hypothermia. De decreased cardiac output, increased systemic vascular resistance, thrombocytopenia, bradycardia, pneumonia, but despite these side effects, there was a significant benefit of hypothermia in these post-cardiac arrest patients. Uh, this continued to be seen in a variety of different uh, both randomized trials as well as observational studies such as the INCAR uh, registry, which uh, uh, in this uh, uh, publication was 1,100 patients, and again, it showed significantly improved outcome uh, than previously has been seen in p patients with cardiac arrest when hypothermia was applied. Uh, despite in this registry, again, since it's a registry and just observational, uh, quite a range of uh, time to Roski, time to return of circulation, time to hypothermia, time to target temperature, uh, and baseline Glasgow coma scale, and post-treatment Glasgow coma scale. Again, despite a significant variety in the types of patients that were being treated, uh, an overall improvement as measured by the cerebral performance category, a very basic scale of neurological outcome. Uh, and again, baseline CPC and post-treatment CPC, significant benefits for uh, a lot of people who'd gotten hypothermia after cardiac arrest. Um, in, uh, uh, in a, and there became then some literature in the cardiac arrest studies. These were patients who had ventricular fibrillation, uh, but most of us who are doing hypothermia research had said, well, why not, why just limit this to ventricular fibrillation patients? It should be any cardiac arrest patients. So uh, in our uh, series in Los Angeles uh, from the uh, Los Angeles Emergency Medicine, Medical Services, uh, we looked at our data from uh, the, the experience in the community, and we saw, again, a significant benefit in those, in all cardiac arrest patients, not in the patients who had non-shockable rhythms as well. Certainly, there's a significantly higher morbidity and mortality in this patient population in general, but those who received hypothermia did better than those who did not, did not receive hypothermia. Uh, this all came to uh, a screeching halt with the targeted temperature management trial that was uh, done out of Sweden, which looked at cardiac arrest patients and randomized patients uh, between 33 degrees Celsius and 36 degrees Celsius, which then brought some confusion because there was no difference in mortality or poor neurological outcome. However, again, many of us uh, in the field would say that there's a lot of issues with this study, uh, but at the very, very least, even 36 degrees Celsius is actually somewhat a mild hypothermia and certainly a very, very tightly controlled temperature management scheme, which is not seen in our patients. And just walking around outside in Singapore, I would say that the baseline temperature of somebody who has a cardiac arrest outside is going to be much higher than 36 degrees Celsius. Uh, so perhaps a mild hyperthermia. Uh, certainly we see that in other patient populations such as in uh, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy of newborns. Uh, there is a significant benefit with uh, hypothermia. So there seems to certainly be a rational sense for hypothermia as a therapy for neurological outcome as it regulates um, uh, between the demand of the cerebral uh, blood flow from hypothermia and the supply uh, of uh, uh, increase cerebral, um, cerebral blood flow supply. So you decrease the demand and you can modulate the supply. Uh, so this is certainly used, considered in, in brain injury after cardiac surgery. Cardiac surgery has a significantly high morbidity with uh, neurological injury and so uh, there's a, a lot of use of hypothermia prophylactically uh, pre-surgery as a means of protecting the brain. 
um, and you can see it also in anesthesia studies as well. Again, significant theoretical benefits of hypothermia uh, as a neuroprotective agent pre-injury. Uh, and in the uh, animal models as well, we can see with delivery of hypothermia before stroke uh, that the size of stroke is significantly decreased uh, when hypothermia is applied to those patients who did not get hypothermia, uh, and then a stroke is delivered to the patient. So hypothermia in ischemic stroke uh, seems to have uh, some rationale as well. Uh, and certainly there have been a number of small trials of uh, applications of hypothermia for stroke patients after they receive the stroke uh, in patient populations. But these are all studies of less than 100 each. They're just uh, typically um, just reported uh, experience with hypothermia and uh, dividing those patients between the ventilate, uh, these studies between those who were looking at ventilate patients versus non-ventilated patients as a sort of a uh, uh, measure of severity of stroke. Uh, there seemed to be some improvement in those patients who had hypothermia applied to them uh, after their stroke patients in both groups, actually, both in the ventilated and non-ventilated patients, uh, which led me to uh, start a trial uh, of uh, controlled hypothermia and large infarction. Sorry, we gra gathered a group of uh, investigators together, of uh, like-minded investigators, to look at uh, a patient population of large hemispheric stroke within 72 hours of onset uh, and develop certain parameters, uh, which realized that there's actually no real hard evidence for the parameters that we chose. For instance, which temperature should we shoot for? So we chose 35 degrees Celsius. How quickly should we rewarm patients? Uh, what kind of shivering prophylaxis, et cetera? Uh, so there were some uh, different thoughts on this among the different investigators, but uh, a trial was, um, was a protocol was developed, uh, and uh, we certainly seem to st start to see some benefit in uh, initial patients that we uh, started on the trial, uh, but. Uh, the study was stopped because of funding issues, unfortunately. Uh, it, it seemed to make sense, again, that a large stroke has a huge mechanism of injury uh, and multiple different pathways for delivering the injury uh, to the patient uh, and a cascade of, of issues that single neuroprotectant agents uh, would not be able to take care of, but a hypothermia, which treats all of these different mechanisms, may have some kind of benefit. Uh, and this has been constantly looked at uh, between hypothermia and normothermia in a variety of different settings, uh, here in intracerebral hemorrhage as well, uh, and now in uh, intravenous thrombolysis. Uh, there's been one study for uh, looking at patients after reperfusion delivering hypothermia. Uh, with uh, thrombolytic agents, with TPA, and so there seems to be some signal for benefit, but not completely proven. So a variety of different trials have been looked at, both in Europe and in the United States. Uh, and continually, uh, now a larger trial is going on in the uh, United States, the ICTUS-2 trial, looking at uh, hypothermia delivered after uh, reperfusion therapies with uh, endovascular devices. Hypothermia for severe tra traumatic brain injury has also been looked at over the years. Constantly some signals for benefit in small studies, uh, but uh, finally in large studies, uh, the NAVIS-2 trials, the National Acute Brain Injury Studies in the United States, uh, there seemed to be actually no significant benefit, even with uh, a clear differential in, in temperature. Uh, and so the studies often got stopped for futility, this, uh, the NABIS-2 is particularly. Uh, in intracerebral hemorrhage, there's a thought that there should be some benefit as well because of, um, uh, and different studies have been uh, done uh, to look at exactly this, and I'm oh, sorry, so I'm going quickly. Uh, with uh, differential in uh, temperature management, and the idea being that here in the intracerebral hemorrhage uh, patient population, the blood is actually toxic to the brain, causing a, a severe inflammatory reaction, and so hypothermia may help them to lessen the inflammatory reaction of the blood as well. Uh, but again, unfortunately, nothing completely proven here. All right, so the problem is, that there seems to be a lot of 
uh, theoretical advantages of hypothermia. The people who uh, are looking into this really believe in hypothermia as a uh, definite therapy that should be uh, feasible and should work, and yet we still haven't been able to prove anything. So perhaps one of the issues is that how we do hypothermia is actually uh, an issue, and so developing newer devices may help improve our ability to apply hypothermia, uh, and perhaps maybe more localized hypothermia um, uh, devices, uh, such as this intranasal cooling device, may uh, help to deliver hypothermia to the area that we're trying to protect, which is actually the brain directly, uh, so that maybe we're looking, have to rethink of how we're delivering hypothermia. Certainly, the timing of hypothermia is another issue. How it certainly seems to work prophylactically. However, we can't always be cooled and know when we're going to have our stroke. Uh, and so delivering it maybe quicker by uh, delivering it, these hypothermia devices into the uh, emergency medical system, into the ambulances, and delivering it as quickly as possible after injury may have some significant benefit. Uh, the indications for hypothermia, for those of us believers who believe in hypothermia, uh, there's just too many possible indications that count. But the variables that we have to be, that surround the application of hypothermia are also significant, such as the depth of hypothermia. Which temperatures should we shoot for? The timing, how long do we cool somebody? Uh, and, or how soon after the injury? And how long do we cool these patients? And how slowly or quickly do we rewarm patients? How do we manage the shivering? Uh, and other complications uh, that are involved. Uh, still a lot of work in the area that's being done and hopefully we'll have some good advantages. Uh, but in the meantime, perhaps, again, prophylactic hypothermia uh, is what we need to do. And so keep our rooms cool and, and, uh, and maybe protect our brains before our next stroke occurs. Thank you.